Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. People Fixing the World is the podcast looking for solutions to the problems we face today. It could potentially ease the suffering of millions. We have a solution. Let's do it. People Fixing the World from the BBC World Service. This is the global news podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Janet Jalil and in the early hours of Monday the 15th of April, these are our main stories. At an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council, the head of the UN has warned the Middle East is on the brink of a full-scale devastating conflict and must step back. Israel's ambassador to the UN said Iran had crossed every red line with its attack on the Jewish state and that Israel reserved the right to retaliate. In other news, Haiti's main political parties have urged a quicker transfer of power, accusing the outgoing Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, of changing the terms of an agreed deal. Also in this podcast... If someone says a specific date or like an event, I can just retrieve it in split seconds. The teenager with a memory like an encyclopedia... Neither the region nor the world can afford more war. The words of the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, at an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council, called after Iran carried out its first ever direct attack on Israel, firing hundreds of missiles and drones on the Jewish state on Saturday night. Mr Guterres said people in the Middle East were on the brink of a devastating full-scale conflict. It's time to step back from the brink. It's vital to avoid any action that could lead to major military confrontations on multiple fronts in the Middle East. Civilians are already bearing the brunt and paying the highest price. And we have a shared responsibility to actively engage all parties concerned to prevent further escalation. The U.S. has firmly backed Israel in fending off this unprecedented Iranian attack, but it's also made it clear it does not want to see the crisis in the Middle East escalate either. President Joe Biden is reported to have told the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, that if Israel does decide to go ahead with a counter-offensive against Iran, America will not participate in it. The U.S. envoy, Robert Wood, said the U.N. Security Council needed to strongly condemn Iran. The Security Council must unequivocally condemn Iran's aggressive actions and call for Iran and its partners and proxies to cease their attacks. The United States also supports Israel's exercise of its inherent right to defend itself in the face of this attack. And let me be clear. If Iran or its proxies take actions against the United States or further action against Israel, Iran will be held responsible. The United States is not seeking escalation. Our actions have been purely defensive in nature. The best way to prevent such escalation is an unambiguous condemnation from the Council of Iran's unprecedented large-scale attack and an unequivocal call on it and its proxies and partners to refrain from further violence. For his part, Israel's ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, said Iran had crossed every red line and that Israel reserved the right to retaliate. And he also had this to say. This attack was launched from Iranian soil, as well as from Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. Colleagues, from the moment I began my tenure here, in every speech and in countless letters, I rang the warning bell regarding Iran. I called on this council to take concrete action against the Ayatollah regime. I made it clear that Iran and its hegemonic ambitions of global domination must be stopped before it drives the world to a point of no return. There was a strong response from Iran's representative, Saeed Iravani. Iran's operation was entirely in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. This concluded action was necessary and proportionate 
It was precise and only targeted military objectives and carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation and prevent civilian harm. So, fiery exchanges. Our UN correspondent, Neda Torfik, was watching the emergency meeting. That's absolutely right. Yeah, bitter enemies uh, there in the council. And from the Israeli ambassador, really an opportunity to talk about uh, what they wanted here, uh, to talk about Iran and what they see as their destabilizing activities in the region, as he put it. And he said that the, you know, Iran was on the verge of becoming a nuclear power, that he wanted uh, the countries in the Security Council to reimpose sanctions on Iran. He also asked for the IRGC to be uh, designated a terrorist organization and said that Israel reserved the legal right to retaliate uh, based on Iran's uh, attack, that they won't settle for inaction. Uh, but again, uh, we heard from Iran as well. For them, for their part, that they don't seek an escalation of the war in the region. They said they were doing this out of self-defense from Israel's attack on its embassy. Uh, and so they said they p- had proved that by demonstrating a commitment to peace with restraint, by warning the United States underscoring uh, their intent for de-escalation after this, not wanting uh, to expand it. But then they also hit on a a point that they uh, have also made, that they see the root cause of all of this as what's happening in Gaza and the Palestinian question, the two-state solution, and really taking a hit at the United States for what they call hypocritical behavior and being unable to uphold peace and security in the region. Because the U.S. is is probably the the key player in all this. The U.N. Security Council hasn't really managed to to influence Israel at all very much in the past. And in fact, Israel has criticized the U.N. for for past statements. What is the U.S. position on this? And and does any of this provide some kind of uh, way out for the people of Gaza who've seen so much death and destruction in the past six months? It's a great question because uh, the United States really is kind of the key piece here. As you say, uh, the Security Council is bitterly divided, so it's unable to act. And when it has been able to, when the United States did agree finally to a ceasefire resolution after vetoing several ceasefire resolutions, well, we see it's not being implemented on the ground. When the United States calls for more aid into Gaza, I mean, children are literally dying of starvation as we speak. The UN says famine is imminent. And yet, you know, aid is not getting in nearly enough up until now, despite uh, Israel saying it will open more corridors uh, into Gaza. So the United States has expressed its frustration very publicly with Israel um, when it comes to uh, saying it's indiscriminately attacking civilians. It's not letting enough aid in. Uh, So there have been public disagreements with its ally, even as it has tried to shield it in the council up until recently. And we have heard here today, well, heard from the United States, that they don't want an escalation. Uh, President Biden warning Israel that they will not join any retaliatory attack against Iran. But at the same time, using this forum to say that they stand rock solid in Israel's defense. So the United States is in a situation where the rest of the world is looking at them, hoping that they can prevent a slide into an all-out war in the Middle East and hoping President Biden can use his influence to do that. Neda Torfik. So the big question now is how Israel will respond to all these calls for restraint. Israel says it was able to intercept nearly all of the incoming projectiles with the help of its allies, including the US, Britain, Jordan and France. No one was killed and the damage was minor, although one young girl was critically wounded. A senior minister, Benny Gantz, made it clear that Israel would wait a while as it considers what action to take in response to Saturday's attack. Yesterday, Iran launched an attack on Israel and met the strength of the Israeli security system. Iran is a global problem. It is a regional challenge and it is also a danger to Israel. And yesterday, the world clearly stood together with Israel in the face of the danger. Faced with the threat of Iran, we will build a regional coalition and collect the price from Iran in a way and at a time that suits us. But our Middle East correspondent Hugo Beshega in Jerusalem told us that Israel's allies are deeply worried about what it might be planning. 
So we still don't know how Israel is going to respond to this attack, if the Israelis are going to go ahead with any kind of retaliation. Obviously, the Israeli authorities had warned before this attack that any kind of direct attack from Iran would lead to an Israeli response. But I think what we're seeing today is that there's been a massive effort to try to de-escalate the situation. There was a phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu overnight and President Biden reaffirmed America's commitment to the security of Israel. But there have been reports suggesting that he also said that the U.S. will not support any kind of Israeli retaliation. And now we're hearing from an American official saying that Israel needs to think carefully about its next steps because of the risk of regional escalation. What impact has all this had on Israelis? Because school activities were cancelled yesterday as troops were put on high alert. Are those measures easing? Have Israelis been reassured by the fact that nearly all these missiles and drones were intercepted? Yes, so the measures that were announced today, which also included uh, restrictions on public gatherings, expire tomorrow night. Today, there was already the feeling of life going back to normal here. The airspace reopened this morning. Shops were busy. Lots of people went back to work. Today was the first day of the work week. There were no restrictions in place. And I spoke with some Israelis today and almost everybody I talked to was celebrating the fact that the Israeli defense was extremely successful. 99% of those drones and missiles were intercepted by the Israeli military and also by it allies. So it is a source of celebration today here. Yes, because up until quite recently, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been facing fierce criticism from outside Israel, from allies, even President Biden, for the way Israel is conducting its war in Gaza. With troops still there, can Israel afford to carry out a strike in Iran that could spiral into a wider regional conflict? Yeah, I think, you know, this is the key question here. And this is the, you know, main fear, the possibility of a wider regional conflict. And I think that's the reason why there's been a lot of diplomatic activity to try to reduce tensions from the G7 to the UN Security Council. Now, many believe that uh, given the magnitude of this Iranian attack that the Israelis need to give some kind of response. But some others believe that it is time for restraint, that despite the scale of this attack, it didn't really have an impact on the ground because, again, 99% of the drones and missiles were intercepted. So I think many people here are just trying to draw a line and try to consider this case resolved. Hugo Beshega in Jerusalem. Iran says a new equation in its confrontation with Israel has been opened. The chief of Iran's army, General Mohammad Hossein Begari, warned of a much bigger assault if Israel does decide to respond. From our point of view, this operation is over, and there is no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. Hardly any of the missiles fired by Iran hit their targets, with Israel saying it intercepted 99% of them. I asked Sirvash Mehdi Ardlan from the BBC Persian service, given that, how was the attack being viewed in Iran? So we have two narratives going on here at the same time. One is this figure of 99% interception, which shows that Iran miserably failed in its attack. On the other hand, we're hearing that Iran on a very calculated basis, it made a calibrated move. So really, it designed itself to fail. So these the, these two narratives run con- in contradiction to each other. But what the Iranian officials have said and have confirmed this proposition that its response was calibrated was the fact that they give 72-hour notification to its neighbors, and also they assured the U.S. that the attack would be limited. So I guess that went a long way in terms of satisfying the regime, the Iranian regime's popular base that Iran is not a pushover, but at the same time uh, did not engage in that kind of a a response, an all-out response that would automatically invite uh, an Israeli retaliation. Uh, And if Israel was to carry out an attack on Iranian soil, how would Iran respond? Would we be looking at all-out war? 
Well, it depends on the kind of response that Israel decides to take on. If Israel, from the range of options that's available to Israel, if Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet decide to exercise some strategic patience of their own, well, then, yes, uh, whether what the uh, head of the Revolutionary Guard said today, that we change the equation now for every time that Israel attacks us, we will carry out a similar assault, which is unlikely to happen if Israel does anything to Iran. But if Israel decides to take on the other extreme range of its options, Options, an all-out attack on Iran's military and uh, nuclear sites, then it may very well be likely that Iran can walk out of the MPT, that Iran could launch an attack on Israel's Dimona nuclear facilities and unleash the uh, missile arsenal of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Sirvash Mehdi Adlan. Well, Matthew Amrolliwala asked our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, what Saturday night's unprecedented attack on Israel by Iran means for the wider Middle East. Unprecedented in that sense. Uh, the two sides have been engaged in a, a shadow war for decades, really, in which Iran has been using its proxies, uh, groups like Hezbollah, to uh, fire missiles and carry out other activities against Israel and even inside Israel. Um, And Israel has been targeting, for instance, Iranian nuclear scientists going back decades, including within Iran. But you've not seen that kind of direct confrontation that we've seen, and including that uh, targeting of an Iranian consulate in Damascus. So I think it is an escalation. It is significant. But the question is, what next? Well, exactly, because uh, President Biden and others can talk about containment, but there are so many variables at play, aren't there? That's right. And you can sense from the language coming out from the US that they are urging both publicly and I'm sure behind the scenes Israel to carry out a measured response in how it deals with this because the US do not want to escalate into a wider war. All the signs have been that Iran also doesn't want to escalate into a wider war or to get into a war with the United States, which could obviously be very serious for the the regime in Tehran. So there are incentives not to escalate. But the reality of these situations is is often that uh, events can spiral out of control. And you could imagine a situation in which one side launches a strike which kills more, does more damage than expected. And that does lead to an escalation which can drag more parties in and lead to more significant strikes. So I think that is the concern as everyone waits to see what Israel will do. I mean, the noises coming out of Israel are mixed. I mean, we've heard some of the more hawkish members are linked to Benjamin Netanyahu and his coalition talking about the need to re-establish deterrence, which would mean a, a hardline stance and some kind of strike against Iranian interests. Others like Benny Gantz, who's in the war cabinet, have talked about rather responding in a manner and a, a means of a, and a time of their choosing, which would suggest a more measured, careful response. So I think there will be uh, lots of thoughts, lots of behind the scenes negotiations to try and uh, work out what that response might be. And I think uh, it's hard to say exactly at the moment. Given what you have just said, and we're looking at a picture from the Situation Room with uh, Joe Biden watching those events unfold, the White House putting out this line that Joe Biden has told Netanyahu that the US would not participate in a counteroffensive against Iran if Israel launches one. So uh, do you think that is uh, helpful in the sense that it is a very clear line that's already being drawn and being drawn publicly? Yes, and I think behind the scenes what you hear the Americans are supposedly saying to the Israelis is this has gone pretty well from Israel's point of view. Uh, Iran felt it had to strike back for that uh, attack on the consular building. Iran did strike back, but actually Israel was able to knock out 99% of the drones and missiles that were launched and there was very little damage according to Israel. So the American message is to say Israel should largely take that rather than to escalate again and to try and put a lid, if you like, on the situation. Gordon Carrera. Still to come. So if I needed to turn left, he'd say go left in five, four, three, two, one, go right in the same manner. If there were people in front of me, he'd tell me to slow down. The heartening story of a blind man who's become the first person to complete a marathon not tied to another runner. People Fixing the World is the podcast looking for solutions to the problems we face today. It could potentially ease the suffering of millions. We meet people with smart ideas. 
discover how they might change the world for the better. And this is a fairly cheap and easy way to get lots more solar capacity into the middle of cities. People Fixing the World from the BBC World Service. We have a solution. Let's do it. Listen now, wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Haiti's main political parties have urged the outgoing Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, to speed up the installation of a new transitional council that is due to take over power and organise the next presidential election. Mr Henry promised to stand down a month ago. Leonardo Rocha reports. Mr Henry has been in power since the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse three years ago, which plunged the country into unprecedented levels of gang violence and lawlessness. He agreed to resign after Haiti's powerful gang leaders took control of the country's main airport and blocked his return from an international trip. A transitional council representing different parties and political groups should already have been installed to replace Mr. Henri, who's still in Puerto Rico. But they say that a decree he published on Friday failed to mention the names of the nine council members and created new obstacles to their appointment. Leonardo Rocha. People in Australia are mourning the deaths of five women and a male security guard who died trying to stop a man wielding a knife from killing others at a Sydney shopping centre. The attacker has been identified as 40-year-old Jao Kauchi, a man with a history of mental health problems. A lone policewoman is being hailed as a hero after she tracked him through the building as he carried out his rampage. She challenged him and shot him dead as he tried to stab her. Twelve people were wounded, among them a baby girl whose mother was one of those killed. Regular visitors to the shopping centre, like 14-year-old Emily Colonnette, are struggling to comprehend what happened. I go to the like mall with my friends and stuff, but it's just sad to think like you can't even really like shop normally now without thinking twice about like who's around you and all that stuff. Yeah. With more on what might have motivated the attacker, here's our correspondent in Sydney, Katie Watson. People have been coming here throughout the day to leave flowers and pay their tribute to the victims. It's still very much an ongoing investigation. The shopping mall is still closed. It's an active crime scene and police teams are still working there. They're expected to be working there until at least the early hours of Monday morning. More details have come out over the day. The name of the assailant Joel Couchy, 40-year-old man from Queensland. In terms of motives, they're still very open-minded about exactly how and why this attack took place. They say, authorities say that ideology wasn't identified as one of the reasons. Mental health issues certainly might be playing a part in this. Uh, He was known to uh, police. They're also exploring the line of inquiry of whether or not women were a target, given that five out of the six people who were killed were women. Women. There's been more details, of course, about the victims. Ashley Good was a mother of a nine-month-old little girl. She was killed in the attack and her daughter was also stabbed. She went to hospital, underwent surgery, and the family say she is doing well. Now, the one man who was killed uh, in Saturday's attack, he has been named as Faraz Tahir, a 30-year-old from Pakistan. He fled persecution from Pakistan just a year ago and he was working as a security guard in the shopping centre. But this is an investigation that's very much still continuing and, of course, will continue for the next weeks and months. Katie Watson in Sydney. The war in Ukraine could lead to another big rise in energy prices, especially in Europe, according to the man who used to run the country's state oil company. Andrei Kobolyev said Russian attacks on gas and electricity plants were far worse than they had been in the previous winter. Here's our Europe regional editor, Paul Moss. Ukraine won't say exactly how much damage there's been to its energy infrastructure, but Russia now seems to be focused on hitting its generating capacity. And that, warns Andriy Kobolyev, will put up prices across Europe. That's firstly because Ukraine itself will need to get energy from elsewhere. However, there's also a fear that its vast energy storage facilities will come under Russian control. Indeed, just the possibility of a Moscow victory could lead to a price hike, Mr Kobolyev said. He acknowledged Ukraine had attack Russian gas facilities, but said there was an energy war underway. Paul Moss. Now, what if I was to ask you what you were wearing this day four weeks ago? How about four months ago or even 
four years ago. You and I might struggle to remember, but there are a select few who would find this question extremely easy to answer. That's because they have a memory that's like an encyclopedia or a search engine, and they can access that information in an instant. One such person is Emily Nash from Canada, and her extraordinary ability is being studied by a team of scientists. Stephanie Prentice reports. People with a highly autobiographical memory can recall information from any time in their life and watch any day back, just like watching a film. They don't need mnemonics or other prompts to trigger recall, and fewer than a hundred people in the world have ever formally been diagnosed. If someone says a specific date or like an event, I can just retrieve it in split seconds. Emily Nash, a teenager from Canada, was recently tested by a group of experts in Chicago and in Texas. It pops into my head, and it's almost like a visual. I can remember like the specific day it happened, sometimes even the time and what happened exactly. Emily can remember the details of any day in her life, including what she was wearing, who she was with, and everything she ate. She can also pull out details of days from before she was born if she's ever heard any information about them. Okay, how about October fourth, nineteen seventy? I know you weren't alive then, but is there anything specific about that date? Oh, Janice Joplin died. Carmen Westerberg, a psychologist at Texas State University, has been studying Emily's memory to try and understand it, but also to harness that knowledge to help others. If we can figure out what exactly is happening that makes her have such a good memory, if we can somehow use that information to help people who have failing memory, and with our society today living longer, which is great, but that means there's a lot more cases of memory problems. So that's why I think it's really important to try and figure out what's going on. People with this sort of memory often say the worst part is they remember every bad thing that's ever happened to them, but they also remember every kind word, gift, or special occasion. And whenever they want, they have the option to time travel. Usually during my free time, I like to bring up positive memories, the good memories that I have. Just remembering like special days of my life and. All the nice things like everyone has ever done for me, and just basically remembering like all the positive things that helped shape who I am today. That was Human Encyclopedia. Emily Nash ending that report by Stephanie Prentice. A man who lost his sight during a COVID lockdown has become the first blind runner in the world to complete a marathon without a guide attached to him by a tether. Yaya Pandor, who's 28, ran the Manchester Marathon in Northern England, relying only on the voiced instructions of his guide nearby. He finished this, his first ever marathon, in four hours, 22 minutes and 23 seconds, beating his own target time. He told Julian Marshall how he was able to accomplish this feat. So I'm fully blind and I had a guide run with me, but he wasn't connected to me in any, in any way. And he gave me voice commands throughout the entire process. So if I needed to turn left, he'd say go left in five, four, three, two, one, go right in the same manner. If there were people in front of me, he'd tell me to slow down. If there was uneven footing on the ground, he'd be like, be careful where you're stepping just because it's uneven ground. And he also audio described the entire process, what was happening in the buildings around me, what people were wearing, just so I could gauge where he was by hearing so I didn't go off track. I mean, that's quite an achievement. I mean, if I think of myself closing my eyes and, and trying to run, I, I'd be all over the place. I am mentally and physically 